Уважаемые коллеги, здравствуйте, я прошу прощения за технические проблемы. Вот у нас, к сожалению, с Украиной не сработала программа GoToWebinar, и в последующем, наверное, мы будем все-таки работать в Zoom, потому что люди звонят, люди расстроены, что не получилось. Безусловно, по техническим, те, у кого были технические проблемы, сертификаты мы сделаем и ссылку на лекцию мы предоставим. Данный вебинар есть стартовый, мы будем посмотрим, как у нас получится в дальнейшем. Мы планируем с профессором Кристианом Дилом проводить по одному вебинару в месяц. И э, приглашать на них интересных лекторов из э, разных стран. Вот. Э, ну, давайте, наверное, начнем с моего доклада, а в дальнейшем мы уже послушаем профессора Дила. Я расскажу про изменения на коже у пациентов как ранний постковидный синдром. Уже больше полутора лет с осени 2019 года мир традиционно и неожиданно столкнулся... Так, ну секунду. Традиционно и неожиданно столкнулся с пандемией COVID-19. И вполне традиционно в очередной раз оказался явно не готовым к активному противодействию развившейся очередной вирусной эпидемии. Она внесла существенные коррективы в повседневную жизнь фактически всех стран мира. И, пожалуй, именно это наиболее заметно в изменении отлаженного быта и производственной активности наиболее развитых стран мира и Европы. Появился новый термин «постковидный синдром» – изменения в органах и системах, которые сопровождаются ковидом включающий в себя также видимое поражение кожного покрова различной локализации. Изменения кожного покрова, как известно, могут носить самый разнообразный характер, могут даже в ряде клинических ситуаций имитировать различные известные нам заболевания кожи и отражать неудовлетворительное состояние ряда органов и систем организма пациента. И вот на данном слайде представлена информация от Европейской академии дерматологов осеннего онлайн-конференции, то есть уже когда, соответственно, мы полгода были на карантине, про поражение кожи, которые встречаются при ковиде. Существует достаточно много классификации, много публикаций уже на эту тему. Вот одна из публикаций в британском журнале дерматологии, которые э, предоставили информацию о различных э, симптомах, которые, которые сопряжаются с э, э, поражениями кожи в том числе. И э, на данный момент существует... Э, Одна из наиболее принятых, из наиболее известных классификаций изменений на коже при ковиде – это когда поражается окральная область, эритема, отек с единичными пузырьками и пустулами. В 19% случаев происходит другие визикулярные высыпания. В 9% случаев некоторые из них располагаются на туловище, состоят из небольших мономорфных пузырьков на одних и тех же стадиях, в отличие от полиморфных пузырьков при ветряной оспе, например. Они также могут поражать конечности, иметь геморрагическое содержимое, увеличиваться в размерах или распространяться по всему телу. Крапивница в 19% случаев. В основном они располагаются на коже туловища, сгруппированно и рассосредоточено. Могут располагаться также на ладонях. Другие макулопопулезные высыпания, 47% случаев, некоторые были описаны как похожие на розовый петериаз. Иногда также присутствовала клиническая картина 
высыпание характерное для пурпулы. И последнее это ливида или некроз в 6% случаев. У пациентов наблюдалось поражение различной степени, которые предрасполагались к окклюзионное сосудистое заболевание, включая области ишемии. Ну и далее пару слов о том, что было сделано нами. Совместно с коллегами-реаниматологами и инфекционистами мы как дерматологи наблюдали у ряда пациентов с подтвержденным лабораторным диагнозом COVID-19 появление на коже высыпаний, которые можно было характеризовать как розация подобная. Причем у одних пациентов подобные высыпания проявлялись на фоне уже развернутой клинической картины, а у других это проявлялось как постковидный э, синдром. Причем у большинства из, э, пациентов все-таки это уже при э, отрицательных тестах COVID-19, когда заболевание, собственно, уже э, было э, вылечено с точки зрения инфекционистов. У э, большинства пациентов, у которых наблюдалась подобная симптоматика, также э, из сопутствующих заболеваний можно было выделить гипертоническую болезнь, ожирение, э, сахарный диабет. И вот несколько клинических случаев. Такая пациентка 64 года, заболела остро, высокая температура до 40 градусов, Температура ничем не коррегировалась, и пациентка принимала противовирусные препараты. На седьмой день болезни, когда температура уже давно спала, появились вот подобные высыпания. В анамнезе диабет, гипертоническая болезнь и ожирение. Следующая пациентка, 64 года, заболела остро, тоже высокая температура до 40-41 градусов. Тоже ничем не коррегировалось. Высыпания появились на восьмой день болезни, опять же, когда температура снизилась до нормальных цифр. В анамнезе также гипертоническая болезнь ожирения. Пациентка 69 лет. Заболела остро, высокая температура до 40 градусов. Высыпания появились на 14-15 день болезни. На фоне нормализовавшегося общего состояния, нормализовавшейся температуры. Оставалось единственное, что общая слабость. Также гипертоническая болезнь ожирения. 63 года. Заболела остро, высокая температура 40 до 40 градусов. Ничем не коррегировалась температура. Высыпания на лице появились на седьмой день болезни на фоне нормализовавшейся температуры. В анамнезе гипертоническая болезнь и ожирение. Вот единственная из данной подборки пациентка молодого возраста и 40 лет. Тоже высокая температура, ничем не коррегировалась. Высыпание седьмой день болезни. Но вот у нее также гипертоническая болезнь и ожирение в анамнезе. 58 лет пациентка заболела остро, высокая температура. Высыпание на седьмой день болезни, гипертоническая болезнь и ожирение. На самом деле подобных пациентов у нас на данный момент уже больше 30. Я подобрала самые интересные клинические случаи. Появление розации подобных высыпаний на лице следует расценивать именно как специфическое ранее проявление метаболических микронарушений периферической васкулярной системы в зоне расположения множества мелких сосудов, обостренная ковидной болезни. В основе же этого явления, вероятно, лежат дистрофические процессы печени, обусловленные повышением уровня гомоцистеина при одновременном дефиците аденометионина. И с нашей точки зрения это также может способствовать наличию пациентов, наличие в анамнезе, гипертонической болезни, диабета и ожирения что само по себе создает благоприятный фон для ослабленной вирусом сосудистой стенки. Также интересно заметить, что участие пациентов в течение двух недель, некоторых месяцев, высыпания проходили, участие пациентов, эти высыпания сохраняются до сих пор. 
То есть прошло вот от того, как мы начали это исследование, уже где-то месяца два, и высыпание у этих пациентов сохраняется до сих пор. По мере изучения постковидного синдрома стало очевидным, что необходимо обращать внимание на состояние кожи. Изменения на кожном покрове, по нашим наблюдениям, могут с наибольшей вероятностью возникать как одно из наиболее ранних по времени проявлений поражения сосудистой стенки. Вероятно, это происходит несколько ранее или же одновременно с поражением внутренних органов. Эти проявления можно рассматривать как один из ранних проявлений постковидного синдрома. Я благодарю всех за внимание. Ну, Кристиан, it's a word to you now. Hello. Christian, And uh, I'm sure uh, I really uh, don't to understand, you know, and I don't want to tell you it was interesting because uh, I don't know, but I am sure about it because I was able to follow some uh, things, you know, and especially clinical cases. And uh, I think that uh, COVID-19 really uh, is uh, impacting uh, dermatology, you know, Because uh, yesterday uh, there was a new paper published by a group of uh, Latin American doctors, you know, from 25 countries and uh, in the International Journal of Dermatology. It's a very interesting paper. Uh, regretfully, it was published yesterday. I had no time to uh, insert it in my presentation. Uh, but uh, the most important is that when a patient is suffering COVID-19, uh, in 97% of cases, uh, there are dermatological symptoms, you know, and yes. not only uh, systemic symptoms, but also dermatological. So uh, I think it was uh, really Uh, a very good experience for dermatologists, uh, this uh, pandemic, and uh, we must uh, keep uh, uh, updated about this, you know, because things are changing. Uh, now also, uh, because of uh, vaccination, uh, we have some dermatological symptoms, and we must uh, uh, take care about all of this, and keep updated. And so now I, I will share my uh, screen with you. Mm -hmm. let, let me check because can you see it? Yes, I can see it. So And uh, what I uh, chose to do, because I, I don't want to, you, you can see it still, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't want to repeat uh, more or less what Katerina told, uh, and I uh, decided to do something uh, a little different about this. And uh, see? How, uh, how our new life, you know, it's quite a new life because two years ago, uh, this kind of uh, devices, you know, uh, like uh, alcohol in gel, like uh, face mask, you could only see it in hospitals and nothing else, you know, and now you can see it everywhere. Uh, everybody has to wear a face mask, everybody has to disinfect his hands, it's very important, and really our life changed. And this was uh, también a question of uh, changing of uh, physiological characteristics of the skin uh, because of this of uh, wearing face masks. And uh, there is a very interesting study in Korea Uh, with uh, participants wearing uh, 
KF94 mask during six hours per day. You know, uh, usually uh, when people are working, it's at least uh, six hours. And uh, uh, we are uh, uh, focusing on working people, especially because at home it's completely different. And uh, this study uh, was uh, taking into account uh, voluntaries wearing the mask six hours per day. And the result, not only after six hours, but also after six weeks. And so you can see something that uh, the first uh, parameter was skin temperature. And you can see that what happens after six hours, there is quite a good increase of temperature by two degrees. It's quite an uh, important uh, increase. Also, an increase in the red component, in the redness of the face, you know, uh, wearing a face mask, is provoking redness and not only rosacea, not only uh, acne or inflammatory diseases, we'll talk about this later, but also uh, common redness, you know. On the contrary, the dimension of pores is not changing. The same for skin roughness, it doesn't affect uh, skin roughness, it doesn't affect skin elasticity. But look at this one, transepidermal water loss, you know, uh, dryness of the skin. Uh, water loss is increased uh, a lot. And what does it mean? It means that the skin will be drier with uh, wearing the mask. And another uh, dramatic result, you know, dramatic increase is about uh, sebum production. And this is really maybe the most important fact uh, in uh, as a consequence of uh, wearing a mask during this pandemic. On the contrary, pH uh, is not so different of what uh, it's uh, usually. And you see, after two weeks, uh, it's uh, intermediary result, uh, there is a loss of elasticity. And uh, the same, there is a higher dimension of pores. You know, what we were checking here was after six hours, but when time is spending, and you talk about weeks and weeks, uh, you see that uh, parameters are different. And especially, number of acne lesions is increased, you know. But check something, uh, there were acne lesions at baseline. Uh, this means that the, the patients had acne previous to uh, pandemic, you know, and previous to wearing the mask. And in this case of having uh, acne previously to start of the pandemic, uh, there is an increase in acne lesions. And uh, You know that uh, there is an interesting, this is another one, it's also a Korean study, you know, uh, after wearing the mask, six hours a day, four weeks, and the parameters under study are different, you know. They are taking care about skin wrinkles, skin pores, and uh, about uh, also a questionnaire with the volunteers about uh, what uh, changes did they uh, feel, you know, uh, during the pandemic. And the first thing is about uh, skin wrinkles. And uh, there was not a big change, you see, that it was not so important. There was a small increase, but not so much. Uh, there was a higher increase about the size of pores, you know, which is uh, really a uh, concern for the people, of course. And uh, you see that there is some kind of change in uh, aesthetic uh, conditions of the skin. And uh, what do people think about this? Do you think wearing the mask affects your skin? Totally agree, 
65%, you know, and really, uh, not only we can measure these changes, but the people feel it, you know, and this is very important. And only 20% are not agreeing, and they think that there is no change in their skin in, in spite of uh, wearing uh, uh, face mask. And you see uh, what happens during uh, the pandemic, I told you, is an increase of acne outbreaks when wearing the mask. And especially in the places, you know, where the mask is. If you have acne on your chest, there is no change because your clothes are the same during COVID time or uh, uh, outside. But with the mask, uh, when the lesions are uh, located uh, on the, the place uh, where you are wearing the mask, then you will have increase of uh, acne outbreaks. And uh, you know what? Not only uh, increase in outbreaks, but also uh, flares of acne. You see here uh, in this publication some examples uh, of patients with uh, increased uh, acne flares. And uh, also, this is uh, different, but uh, this is also uh, bad uh, news for the patients, you know. Uh, there may be uh, occurrence of acne in patients without uh, previous acne. And uh, this is a very bad thing. People who never had uh, acne before are now with acne because uh, presumably, you know, because, uh, maybe and almost certainly because of wearing the mask. And uh, this uh, person is a bar employee. Uh, she is using a mask uh, uh, during her whole uh, eight-hour shift, of course, because she is in contact with public, you know. And uh, previously to this uh, episode, she had uh, facial seborrhea, but never acne lesions. And uh, in this case, after uh, sometimes, uh, it was after four months of wearing the mask uh, on daily basis, the clinical examination of this patient showed numerous purples, pustules, and microcomedons. You know, all the signs, all the symptoms of acne, and all of this caused by uh, wearing the mask. And this uh, new uh, entity, let's tell, this new form of acne uh, has a very nice uh, uh, name in English is maskne, you know, and the maskne is a new entity in dermatology. It appeared uh, during COVID uh, pandemic. And of course, uh, you see uh, there, there are various uh, shapes of masks and various uh, types. And depending on the type, uh, acne will show on your face uh, which mask are you using uh, daily. And uh, now uh, there may be also erythematous uh, eruption when using a mask, like in this lady. Uh, uh, this lady uh, was dis disinfecting her face with uh, ethanol 60 percent, uh, uh, five times a day, and using a mask during six hours. And I'm not sure, you know, uh, that there is a need for disinfecting the face with ethanol uh, as uh, often as she was doing, you know. And because of this, she had erythematous eruption on the face. And of course, uh, you must do it uh, uh, with hands. And also in case of hands, we'll see it, there may be erythematous eruption. And this is very important also, there may be occurrence of rosacea in patients wearing the mask, you know, and uh, this uh, lady had no previous rosacea, you know, and uh, this rosacea appeared 
two weeks after starting confinement in Italy and after starting the obligation of uh, wearing face mask. And uh, she had a, only a previous uh, history of flushing, but not of rosacea lesions. And you see that now, after wearing the mask, she is uh, displaying uh, erythematous uh, lesions and uh, erythematous uh, rosacea. And uh, this lady was uh, treated with uh, doxycycline 40 milligrams during uh, 12 weeks, and she was uh, successfully treated. You know, uh, this uh, showed something, this kind of acne of rosacea, which is caused by uh, wearing the face mask, uh, is the same entity as uh, common rosacea, you know, and the treatment uh, must be the same. You have also this case, uh, which was uh, reported by our colleague uh, uh, Volina in uh, Germany, you know, and this patient uh, is uh, 56 years old and uh, no clinical uh, history, you know. Uh, Exclusion of diagnosis of allergic contact dermatitis, you know, by patch test. Patch test was negative, and the diagnosis, and uh, we can see it, and we completely agree, was uh, papulopustular rosacea. And uh, I don't agree about the treatment. You know, it's not a usual treatment. It was uh, metronidazole one gram per day during two weeks and uh, bimecronimus cream. And uh, I don't agree so much, you know, because in such a case, for me, the first line treatment would be uh, more likely a topical treatment, you know, uh, maybe with uh, ivermectin cream or with uh, something like uh, metronidazole. But anyway, the patient was healed, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, papers and puzzles, but uh, erythema persisted after the treatment, you know. Really, this was caused by wearing the face mask, and uh, it was not possible to treat it uh, completely in a satisfactory way for the patients. Well, this is very common, you know. Uh, after that, we'll see uh, statistics about uh, the side effects of uh, wearing face masks and the most common one is exacerbation of lesions of seboroid dermatitis. This patient, 29 year old, uh, had this case, you know, we see very well that the lesions were exacerbated at the place of wearing the mask and the treatment, a uh, successful treatment, was a topical corticosteroid for five days, you know, uh, like a, a strong starting treatment. And following that, topical 1% uh, pimecrolimus during 10 days. It's quite easy to treat, you know, but it's very common. It's a very common side effect of uh, indirect side effect of this pandemic. And you see sometimes, it may be very serious, you know, really uh, there is a very serious exacerbation of uh, seborrheic dermatitis in case of this patient. Well, now I was talking about the statistics, you know, because uh, we are talking about anecdotic cases and so on, but we have to know exactly uh, how much it uh, may represent. Worsening of lesions of seborrheic dermatitis, I told you, are very common. In, a, in an Italian study, up to 46%. In a Chinese one, up to 36 But anyway, around 40%, it's a very high level. Lesions of acne, it's also very common, you know. In 43% of cases, uh, there is increase uh, of uh, symptoms of acne and worsening of the lesions. Uh, rosacea, in all patients with rosacea, 
in the Chinese study, uh, it was asserted that wearing the mask was worsening the symptoms. Pruritus may uh, occur also in around 15% of uh, patients wearing a mask. Uh, erythema, we told it with the lady, you remember, uh, around 12, 13%. Uh, occurrence of the dry skin, you remember that the Korean study was assessing that there was uh, an increase in transepidermal water loss and then drying up of the skin. And this was also uh, reported in reality, you know, and other uh, things. But you know that uh, worsening of uh, lesions of, uh, uh, no, occurrence of pruritus, erythema, and skin dryness account for 49% in of patients. So uh, it's a very common thing, you know, and we must be uh, used to it, you know, we, we must uh, get used to this because uh, patients are coming to the office and are asking about this and we must uh, have uh, some kind of uh, response for the patients. Well, there may be also uh, contact dermatitis when wearing a mask and uh, possible allergens uh, may be uh, Dibromodiacinum butan, which is a preservative in the mask, formaldehyde, you know, it's a very, uh, very well known uh, allergen, very common allergen, which is used uh, in the manufacturing process. Uh, Furam, which is uh, present in the elastic of the mask. Uh, Cocopropylene diamine guanidinium diacetate, which is another preservative uh, in the mask. Uh, there may be residues of polyurethane, part of the manufacturing process. Uh, triglycidyl isocyanurate as a hardener, you know, to, to keep the strength of the mask. And bronopol, which may be an, an impurity. You see that in only one mask, you can find uh, quite a good serious of possible allergens. And this kind of uh, contact dermatitis is not uh, unfrequent, you know. Uh, it's not very common, but you can see it. It's, uh, it's quite usual to, to see it. And you see that this kind of contact dermatitis may be very severe in uh, some cases. And uh, really, uh, we must think about, uh, of course, about the mask and about uh, changing it and about making a patch test, you know, uh, uh, adequate patch test with the possible allergens we mentioned. Well, now I told you very briefly about uh, washing hands with uh, alcoholic gel, you know, and this is a very good thing. And uh, we, we must not avoid to do it. You know, this is compulsory in a time of pandemic, but you can have sometimes uh, erythematous patches, you know, uh, the same as the lady you remember on the face, you can have it also on the hands, and you can also have contact dermatitis, and this is more common with isopropylic alcohol than ethanol, you know. Uh, there is a very few contact dermatitis with ethanol, but with uh, propanol, you can have it uh, much more. And this, you see, uh, now uh, let's uh, focus on healthcare workers, you know, because uh, we have to honor them. They are in the uh, first line, you know, and they are suffering a lot because of this pandemic, uh, helping everybody. And uh, of course, uh, they have to use alcoholic gel and face mask a lot. And the uh, frequency of uh, hand washing during a regular shift, you know, 79% uh, of uh, healthcare workers I, are washing their hands more than 10 times. And we know about this, you know, when we are uh, in an hospital or uh, doctor office or so on, we are 
all the time washing uh, our hands. And 19% between 5 and 10, and only 2% uh, or 1% one, uh, one to four times. So there is a very strong uh, frequency of washing hands. And for this reason, uh, there will be consequences, you know, on the, 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 the hands, like redness, like soreness, like skin cracks, peeling, scaling, uh, swelling, quite a, a lot of uh, bad side effects on the hands, you know, and especially on the back of hands, web spaces and fingers. This is the three places where these uh, changes and side effects are more frequent. And about the face, you know, about uh, wearing the mask, in this case, uh, there is a soreness, redness, we told about it, dryness, we told about it. It may be blistering, but it's very infrequent. Uh, blemishes and skin thickening, and especially on the nose and cheeks, of course, you know, because uh, this is the place uh, which is covered by the mask. And on the contrary, ears are not covered and forehead is not covered anyway. And you see that uh, these uh, signs and symptoms are quite uh, frequent, you see, and depends on the, ma the mask. You know, this kind of surgical mask is probably the best one, you know, in order to prevent these side effects. But if you are talking about FFP3 mask, then you have much more uh, signs and symptoms of soreness, redness, dryness, blistering, blemishes, and skin thickening. And this is another uh, question, you know, we don't talk about it. And uh, I think these uh, Indian investigators had a very good idea, you know. They published uh, this uh, uh, report, this uh, paper, about increase and consequences of self-medication in dermatology. What happened, you know, and uh, in India, especially now, of course. Uh, what happened? Uh, uh, doctors' offices were closed uh, during months, you know, and there was no uh, attendance, you know, for dermatological patients. And what happened? The patients had to go to self-medication, you know, and the patients are not dermatologists. They don't know about this and they cannot uh, prescribe by themselves oral corticosteroids, topical steroids, antibiotics, antifungals, methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, you know, well, antihistaminics, it may be more, but all these uh, entities, you know, need a medical prescription. And we can uh, think, you know, we can imagine that following such a wide auto-medication, self-medication, uh, there uh, have been and will be consequences. And we must be uh, prepared for this. And now about the vaccine, you know, because more, fortunately, more and more people are vaccinated, you know, and we are seeing some dermatological side effects, you know, some dermatological reactions. Uh, for instance, with Moderna vaccine, uh, you have uh, contact dermatitis in uh, some cases. Uh, you have injection site rash, like here, and urticaria. These are the most uh, frequent, most important side effects with vaccines. I took uh, Moderna vaccine uh, in this case because of this uh, publication of this paper, you know, but there are also other papers. I didn't want to repeat it with other vaccines like uh, Pfizer or AstraZeneca, and all the results are more or less similar, you know, and these three uh, cutaneous uh, manifestations 
are the more frequent uh, following vaccination. And look at this one. This is uh, very interesting. Uh, it's not frequent, but uh, uh, at some extent, you know, this is a side effect of COVID-19 vaccination, you know. This uh, lady was uh, with vaccination and two days later, she, she wanted lip plumping, you know, and she did it as a procedure with hyaluronic acid. And you see what happened, lip and geodema quite uh, important following this uh, filler injection, you know. And uh, there is a consensus that if someone ha had a vaccination for COVID-19, you must wait at least two weeks before any uh, filler injection, you know. On the contrary, you can get such a side effect. Uh, the explanation is not uh, very certain, you know, but we think that by uh, increasing uh, immunity, you know, the vaccination is also increasing the possible reaction to injection of hyaluronic acid. But keep this in mind, you know, because really uh, you can avoid it very easily. Uh, you you must wait for two weeks and nothing else. And of course, we had changes in our office, you know, and we must think about first protecting our employees, you know, by using uh, some uh, glasses when it's possible, you know, of course, they have to use a face mask, they must disinfect their hands as everybody, they must avoid direct contact with the public, you know, with the patients, and we must protect ourselves, you know, also, when the patients, before they enter the office, they have to uh, disinfect their hands, they have to wear a face mask and so on, and we must also uh, protect our patients, and doctor office will be a little different, you know, there is not a mountain of uh, patients waiting in the waiting room, but we must uh, give them some space, you know, and avoid uh, uh, very close contamination in this case. So about uh, Silderma products, you know, uh, uh, during this time, because uh, this uh, event was uh, sponsored by uh, LSI Silderma, uh, in case of occurrence or worsening of lesions of seborrheic dermatitis quasic gel, uh, in case of worsening or occurrence of lesions of acne, the same. Cream in case of rosacea, you know, when de novo rosacea or uh, existing rosacea is worsening. And for the occurrence of contact dermatitis, erythema, pruritus, hand dermatitis, we have very good results with Sodermix, you know. And uh, it's not uh, a mere advertising, but uh, it's based on uh, uh, many doctors' experience, and uh, I can guarantee that in these cases, uh, these products are doing very well. So, I thank you very much for your attention.